Welcome to the South Bay Guitar Show, the show that's all about guitars and the people that play them. And for this very special episode, the one and only Mr. Leon Hendricks. It's How great to see you again, brother. You too, man. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Okay, I'm getting a shot from that side too, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I don't have to look over here. <laughs> no, you don't. No, we, uh, okay. we have three cameras rolling on us at this uh, particular moment. Well, finally, we, you have got me down here. Finally, yeah. I know we've talked a, a bunch about it. And it, uh, last time I saw you was maybe five years ago. I think we first met about 16 years ago when you started getting your band going. You're starting to do jams. And oh, everything. yeah, that's right. Yeah. We'll get to that in just a minute. But, of course, we'd be, I guess, remiss if we didn't talk something about your brother. And it could go on forever. Mm -hmm. And I want to, we'll get to your book also, which is outstanding because it covers so much. But um, just a few particulars I've always been curious about that uh, when I read the book, it was bringing a few questions to mind. And I just want to throw a few things at you to see what you remember from so long ago. Uh, particularly when uh, your brother got his first guitar. As mm -hmm. you cover in the book, it was a, well, his first thing was an ukulele, but it was just one string on it. So really, that's yeah. not a guitar. But first the guitar was an acoustic one. he wrote songs on that one string oh yeah yeah, yeah. but when he got his first acoustic it was just an old K mm -hmm. that I think uh, cost five dollars from uh, somebody your dad was working for uh, yes uh, miss McKay uh -huh. uh, we were I have we were room and board with her okay and she had it on the back porch and Jimmy used to see it all the time I called him Buster then his right. name was Buster right so uh, one day he said, can I have that guitar? And she said, no, I want $5 for it. So he asked my dad. My dad said, no, you know, right away. Yeah. No, can back afford then, it. $5 is a lot of money. Oh, hell yeah. And so uh, and then my auntie, Dolores, argued with my dad about getting him the guitar. And then my auntie actually ended up buying it. Mm -hmm. and not my dad. <laughs> so she pitched out the five dollars and he mm -hmm. got that mm -hmm. and it wasn't the greatest guitar in the world but that had enough strings on it that he could get busy. And yeah start something doing because he, he was hearing the music but didn't have any instruments. Right. You know to, uh, he didn't know what it was that he was hearing. Now to play in a band this is just an acoustic mm -hmm. there's not a lot of money coming in. You guys I want to say really had a rough start as, as kids. Mm -hmm. When I read the book it was uh, there were some challenges there. I thought it was fun. It was, yeah. I course, thought that was my that was that was my life. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was like pretty fun. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, challenges in the sense your dad wasn't bringing in a whole lot of money, so trying to do what Jimmy did later, he got himself a pickup on that guitar, right? Yeah, Sears catalog. Mm -hmm. You know, and as you wrote in the book, he wired that up himself and put the pickup in. So yeah. he's finally in business. But then the the next thing missing would be an amplifier. And then he did a little modification on a stereo? Uh, yeah, we had a Decca, old Decca, and um, I don't know how he did it, but I ended up holding the wires for him into the speaker system. I, he bypassed, bypassed the, uh, the turntable mm -hmm. signal and used his guitar, and it came out through the speakers. So he was getting actual electronic sound. Yeah. yeah. and. Uh, and so sometimes I had to hold the wires in the ho speaker holes, right? You know, but he actually uh, turned it into an amp for yeah. himself. I know when we were kids, we took an old Sears uh, real-to-real mm -hmm. recorder, and same way we could bypass it because it had a speaker to just to get, make sound out of it. Mm -hmm. Not the greatest thing in the world, but that's all you got. Yeah. He was on it. <laughs> so from that point, you're hearing electronic music coming out of the house when you're a kid and he's a kid. Yeah. yeah. And so he was trying to play uh, with some of the local guys and do some jams, but that really wasn't quite cutting it uh, using that setup. No, but Jimmy was so good to be so young that the bands kind of lot, you know, uh, gave him a lot of leeway. So they would loan him extra gear yeah. and whatnot, right? And um, and then when he had, you know, they didn't have left-handed guitars in the days, and everybody played right-handed in the bands. Yeah. Sometimes Jimmy didn't have a guitar, but um, so a right-hand guitar player would give it to him and smirk to himself, say, oh, okay, I'll give him a left hand. Uh, you know, he plays left hand. So Jimmy would turn it upside down and play it everything backwards, just as good as he played it forward. Yeah, still you know? able to accomplish some sounds. Yeah, you know, I never wondered if that was fantastic or, you know, outrageous or anything like that. I thought it was just a 
you know, this is my brother. He, whatever he does, that's what I think is happening. Yeah, that's you know, that's, That was my experience. Yeah. You know? So as he progressed, um, eventually he, he wanted to get himself a real electric guitar. Mm -hmm. And again, as you cover so well in the book, uh, the next step up was a, was a Supro. And so he was trying to find funds to get this guitar. And tell us about that one. How did he eventually get the money and how did he get this? Okay. Uh, you know, there were several instances where uh, Jimmy had to get a guitar. Mm -hmm. And the first guitar I remember, it, it wasn't a Subaru. But maybe, you know, I wasn't, maybe, you know, maybe I'm in a foster home or something and he's got one. Mm. But his first guitar that he actually got, he got at Seattle Music. You know, after the, you know, the Sears and Roebuck one, that was good, you mm -hmm. know, for what he was doing and practice and stuff like that. But then um, Seattle Music gave him a guitar on payments, you know. Okay, well, I thought it was the Supra, though, the Ozark model. It was, it was that one right there. That's the Supra. Oh. You're probably thinking of it as the yeah. Ozark. Same color that's too. What I, you're right. That's why I brought this in for you to. <laughs> I'm sorry. To check out. No, it's all right. It, it uh -huh. can be a little confusing. This is part of my collection. This is a 1958 Supro. Now this mm -hmm. is called the dual tone because it has the two pickups. Mm -hmm. Your brothers had the uh, Ozark had the single pickup, but the body was identical. The neck was identical. You want to check that out, and, and so that went, would be the same feel and weight and, and sound mm. and everything. It's heavier than a Fender. It's heavy. Whoa. Solid body guitar. What kind of wood is that? You know, I'm really not sure. I'm going to guess mahogany, but I'm, I'm not certain on that. Probably do some research. Oh, so he God. had this, mm -hmm. but then the story goes this was stolen. Yeah, that was stolen. Gig. So he's back to square one trying to scrounge up money. He did because he was working the Guardian route with your yeah. dad, right? Mm -hmm. So he saved up his pennies, and then he went to... He got a dollar a day. Yeah. Me and, my, me yeah. and Jen, uh, Buster. Yeah, and that was hard working though. I know I worked as a gardener with my uncle when I was young. His I, next guitar, however, was this one. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Electro. This is a 1958 too, so this would have been about the same year and the same color, this bronze color. Mm -hmm. Why don't you check that one out? So that was your brother's second electric guitar. <laughs> a little lighter. You give me a history lesson right now, buddy. <laughs> Remember, I was a kid. I know, I I'm know. I'm 10. It's your perspective. You right? know, 11, 12 years yeah. old, you know. But you would have seen your brother with both of these types of instruments yeah. when you were a kid at the house. And so this was his main guitar that he had even when he went in the military. Yeah, my dad ended up sending it to him right. in a box. Now, of course, this isn't the one because he painted on the front of it mm -hmm. his girlfriend's name, as we've seen in pictures and so forth. Okay, and the name of that girl? Betty Jean. Yep. <laughs> Did you know her? <laughs> yeah. Ah. I used to go with her sister. Ah. We double dated. I'll be. You know what I I'm, I'm also wanted to uh, pick your brain on and I'm curious on? When you were a little kid, of course, you're just this you know, mm -hmm. youngster, five years younger than Jimmy. But you would have been witness to him. Now, I've read where his aunt had a big blues collection of albums and you yeah. guys would play the records. Do you remember him doing like a lot of us did when we were younger, needle on, needle off to try and learn a song, to try and play to it? No. <laughs> That was something you didn't notice. All he did was listen. Really? That's all he did was listen. And just it would stick with memory and then he could apply it? Yeah. Wow. He took those seven notes. You know, those seven notes are infinity. All mm -hmm. the music ever been written in all the world is written within those confines. Mm -hmm. And he was able to hear it, you know. And then translate it through his hands. Yeah. Wow. He, he just, you know. He was on it. He was he, he he tapped into that spirit. That spirit was searching for him, and then when they hooked up, that was it. Yeah. You know? Well, I can believe that. I mean, I, I've often said, I, as he also said, he you didn't believe in the in the world's best guitarist, but you can say your favorite guitarist. And he's always been my favorite guitarist because of that imagination and expression that he had through the guitar. Yeah. He all, he often told me that he, he wished you know there was another instrument because he had took this to the limit, mm -hmm. you know, of where it could go. Yeah. And uh, he wanted to do more, you know, he wanted more shit. He wanted to orchestrate and, and write music for orchestras and symphonies. Right, right. And because um, he had this, 
but then he got stuck. See, he always wanted to keep moving with the music. But then when he got famous, he had to play Foxy Lady and Purple Haze until, until he hated over them over. songs. Yeah. You know? Gets a little old after a while, I guess. Yeah. And so, and then when he wanted to move on, the management hold, held him back because they were making the money, you know, and they were, you know, getting political and all kind of crap. Yeah. Now, getting back to those early days, because, again, you're eyewitness to this, and no one else mm -hmm. can answer these kinds of questions uh, just from your perspective. And of course, when you're young, sometimes you're, you're doing your own games when you're a kid. But I'm curious, was he playing along to the TV or the radio? Because we know that he recorded Peter Gunn, which is an old you know, TV yeah. show from the yeah. day. Was he plucking along while the TV's going and pulling off songs and off the radio? You know, I don't know, but Peter Gunn was one of the first things that I heard on that ukulele. Mm-hmm. You know, dun, 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 dun. Mm -hmm. you know, and we, me, and my dad used to watch it on the TV. You know, the Peter Gunn show. So, do you remember Jimmy like sitting on the couch while the TV's on and was going to town on anything, trying to pick it up? No, I don't. I think he he could pick it up by hearing it right well, away. I mean, in the sense, say a show is on or the radio is mm -hmm. on, is he playing along while he's hearing it? To your recollection, maybe a little bit, but then he'd start moving off into a new direction. Mm -hmm. You know, he used it as a platform to go somewhere else. Making up his own thing, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's a problem he had in bands, too, in the early days. Because um, uh, he was always experimenting at practice. Mm. You know, and doing far out shit with the guitar and the stuff, and making weird noises. Mm -hmm. And these are all rhythm and blues bands, you know, in that day. And they so, wanted comp conformity. Oh, that's true. Right, right. Know. What they're used to. Yeah. You know, uh, I've seen that in some other interviews of, of girls that he was seen at the time, they said that the old timer guys didn't like a lot of the wild stuff. They wanted it very um, mm -hmm. basic. See, his journey was always a search. You know, you couldn't, it, you know, sometimes uh, when we'd be sitting around jamming, you know, he'd be in the hotel room and he'd be fucking the guitar and uh, people would talk to him and he wouldn't respond. And they would talk to him and he wouldn't respond. And um, I got, I got, I got it then. He, he was into the music, and he might have been writing a symphony of the century. And somebody's asking you kind of, what kind of gravy you want on your rice, you know, and shit like that. You know, to he, wouldn't, he wouldn't be distracted by these things. You know, and so they always <laughs> thought Jimmy was, you know, um, aloof and, and stuff mm. because they, he didn't respond to him all the time. Mm -hmm. But come on, he's writing something in his head, you know. And if you miss it, you might miss it forever. Yeah. It happened to me all the time. Shit, I, sometimes I got good songs, can't remember them, you know, 30 minutes later. You know, I've seen examples of some of his writing where he didn't write music in the sense of uh, like classical arrangements with notes on a chart, but he, he sort of invented his own writing where he put notes and footnotes and stylistic symbols that meant something to him. You remember any of that going on back at the home? No, but he always wished he could write music you know, because he wanted to write out mm -hmm. shit like that. No, he just took the instrument he had because he, he was like a hungry dog. It might be the last meal. So he took what he had his hands on mm -hmm. and he, uh, and that was it. You know, and he took. You know, something else I was just curious on, because um, I, I kind of, I'm trying to relate in my own mind, that, you know, me starting out on guitar or other friends. Mm -hmm. When we're playing at home, sometimes our parents would uh, get a little upset, turn it down or stop playing. I remember when I was starting out, I would play a repetitive riff. And mm -hmm. first couple of times, my dad was, hey, that sounds good. But then after, after 100 a times, I would, you know, knock it off. Do you ever remember your dad kind of getting on him to turn it down or any kind of coaching or saying, hey, that sounds good? Any of that kind of thing? No, because my dad had his own experience with life at that time. He was into his own world, so yeah. to speak. Uh, you know, I love my dad. He was a good dad, you know. He did the best he could for me and Buster, mm -hmm. you know. And I thought we were having fun all these years. Mm -hmm. You know, when lights get turned off and shit, and my dad's struggling and yelling and drinking and gambling and don't come home sometimes. Uh, Jimmy kind of took on the role, you know. And, um, and then it was, he was on his own. Dad didn't care if he, he cared if he caught Jimmy playing left-handed. That was it. He thought that was. That didn't sinister. seem natural to him. All no, right. he thought it, he was superstitious about oh. a left-handed person. And every time Jimmy tried to use his left hand, my dad would admonish him, hmm. and scold him. 
<coughs> so um, what happened was uh, Jimmy learned to play upside down because of that. Because my dad would even slap him in the head for mm -hmm. playing left hand. So my, Jimmy said, OK, I'm not going to take that no more. So every time my dad came in, he'd turn the guitar over and play Walk the other way. right hand. And my dad would be all, <laughs> yeah, Gosh. there's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I wanted to go fast forward a little bit into the time, because we know the story. He went into the Army. Uh, he met Billy Cox. He was still playing mm -hmm. music whenever he could. But when he came back, he was an international star when he came back to home. Now, here's a couple of pictures. One of you guys as kids together. Mm -hmm. But then the time he came, this is in Seattle with you, right? Yeah. And uh, this was outside the home, isn't it? Uh, no, because I see mountains. Oh, okay. There's, water. there's a car, and the, this is a blow-up. Yeah. There's a car over here, so I thought yeah, this I, I think we're taking a, a picture on the road because we're not dressed. We're dressed in traveling clothes. Okay. So, we're, yeah, we're getting out of the car, and we're, you know, up by Mount Vernon or something. Okay. Is this the first time that he came back home then? Yeah. Okay. Because he, he came back for a, a later show, which we'll talk in just a second. But these well, the are... first time he came home actually was with uh, Tommy Chong. Oh, okay. And uh, right. uh, what were they called? Tommy Chong. And that's right. That's right. He played with Tom, of Cheech and Chong. He played with Tommy for a while. Yeah, and uh, he but came, did he come and see the family then? I, I no, thought, he snuck that's through. That's what I thought. Because he was, was embarrassed or something. Okay. You know, he wasn't ready. That's what I thought. This was the time he came back to the yeah, family. This is, yeah, he He's came. He's a home. big star, and your dad's proud of him. Now mm -hmm. here's you and, and Jimmy together, and he's he's wearing your glasses in this picture. Right? Yeah, he's trying them on. So this was the first time he came back home. This is when he went to the high school and got the honor. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. It, it's been like four or five years since he's been home. Right, right. You know. And something else that uh, I wanted to share with you, a uh, little bit of memorabilia. That's an actual uh, ticket stub from the show that... In Vancouver. Yeah, you guys rode together in the car up there. This is one that your, your dad and your stepmom and your grandmother all went. Mm -hmm. And the fun story of your, your poor grandmother, she was seated in the front row and then... I know, right in front of the speaker. Yeah, three Marshall stacks are blasting her and she had to get up and move. You, you were at that show. Yeah, I was busy with the girls. Oh. <laughs> Come on, Jimmy Henry's brother, man. It's yeah. like, it was like, whoa. Right. You know, and then um, that's when my journey began. Right, right. <laughs> but you did see him... Uh, at a couple of shows when he came to town there. And then the rest of the story is what's found in the book is when you came to Los Angeles and kind of hung out with him, caught a few more shows and so forth. Yeah. You, you kind of joined in, a, in a, your own way the entourage, and so you were a witness to all that. Yeah, but I was, sometimes Mike Jeffries would lie to me and because uh, he didn't want no family connections. Right. Because me and Jimmy were having too much fun. He's been portrayed as the, as the villain and so much of your brother's story and legacy. Mm -hmm. Was that your experience with him? You, you yes. found him to be a real problem? Yes, and I, I, I'm the only one that would holler at him and cuss him out. You know, because I was with Jimmy now, and then I was wondering why Jimmy didn't have no money. <laughs> you know? Because they'd do a show, Jeffrey would take the suitcase or whatever full yeah. of cash. In them days, they didn't have Ticketmaster, and you had to go get your money with a gun yeah. and a briefcase. You know, before the show was over, because you know, there's no like waiting overnight to get right. paid. There's no real tracking either. There's no nah. computerized tracking of ticket sales, finances. So it's all kind of under the, mm -hmm. under the rug there, what, what he's pulling off. It's, so you found him to be a, a rather unpleasant person. Yeah, because he, you know, he lied to me about where Jimmy was going. And then sometimes uh, I didn't want to go. Like I didn't want to go to uh, somewhere, maybe in Anaheim or something. And a couple of places I didn't want to go because I, I had my own limo. Yeah. Had all these girls mm -hmm. smoking pot, learning how to do cocaine, drink whiskey. The wild 60s, all the yeah, <laughs> all the vice all that shit, with it. You know. But did you ever see Jeffries, in other words, kind of bully Jimmy, or did Jimmy no. just kind of ignore him? No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't do that in front of us, especially me. See, I'm a street kid. Yeah. You know, I I know a devil when I see one. Right. You mm -hmm. know, and so you know, I I was on it right away. And, uh, and then he didn't like me because when he gave us our allowance, it was $100 a day, something like that. Yeah. And I said, wait a minute, what's going on? You know? 
And so I said, we need more money because we're going to go out and do some stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And so then the money started getting bigger and then pretty soon he didn't want to hear me. And so he would always make it about 500, you know, for allowance and yeah. stuff like that. Really tight, yeah. Well, he met, supposedly anyway, his own tragic end in the plane crash and anything. Oh, he's but not in Brazil? <laughs> well, Hitler went? That's one of the reports that he was in no, that I'm plane crash. Kidding. Who knows, right? Uh, I, I know. I'm pull, you know, people ask me, said, well, I said, who cares now? Yeah. You know, he's out of the picture regardless. And one C, I got a, this, this uh, retired CIA agent. And, you know, and we're pretty good friends. I met him in India. And I asked him, I said, who killed Jimmy? And he looks at me and he goes, Leon, do you really want to know? You know, in a way that ain't good <laughs> or, or bad. Or you, I don't know how you could take it. You know, I want to say that when you, you take in the total, the accounts, mm -hmm. all the stories and the reports and everything, um, it does look nefarious. And the more time it goes on, the more it kind of looks that way, but you will probably will never really know. Wait till you see the FBI reports, yeah. you know, the redacted stuff. They've been yeah. following Jimmy around because he was like the leader of the revolutionary hippie party yeah. or something like that, you know. Yeah, th those were the times when, and then when he, everybody, Martin Luther King was under you yeah. know, surveillance and everything. And then when he was hanging out the, in Berkeley with the musket and the American flag over there, right. Hoover or Truman or whoever was in charge said, this, we got to watch him, keep him down, you know, because he, he's going to get too much power. Yeah. All the black men with power in that era are dead. Sad but true. Yeah. And speaking of which, uh, this is uh, an original picture I was showing you earlier. Um, that hopefully it will come up on the camera without too much glare. Mm -hmm. uh, of you at the service. A sad day. Yeah. And this is your, this is Freddie May. Mm -hmm. She was your aunt, is that right? Uh, she was a, a good friend of my mother's. Oh, I'm sorry. You know. And this was your stepmother, June. Mm -hmm. Stepdaughter, Janie. Mm -hmm. And your dad, Al, at the service. Mm -hmm. And that's still fresh in your mind? Or you put it aside? It's a part of my, uh, my whole memory and history. I, you know, I, didn't, I don't remember that picture exactly, but I've seen other ones. Yeah. You know. well, there's others of that day in the service. But now, fast forward, I guess. Uh, I wanted to point out the book, and I brought in my copy, you thankfully signed years ago for me. Wow. This is an outstanding book on your brother's life and legacy, and it covers so much greater detail, especially the early years, which is why I wanted to. Yeah, before get out he's of famous. Here. You know, this yeah, is how exactly. he became Jimmy. Exactly. Right. You know? Which I enjoyed reading this. Uh, I put it in my top five of all, and there's hundreds of books on, on your brother. That poor Arthur. <laughs> he had to follow me around, and sometimes you know, when I was an alcoholic, you know. Yeah. Uh, he followed me around. I said, no, not today. And he'd be on, catch a plane and meet me in Denver or something. Just to pick your brain and get all the stories. Yeah, out. because he was getting paid, mm. you know, from the publisher to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to get this shit done, you know. Well, he signed it for me, too. So yeah, I, I love him. <laughs> I like him. He was him. a nice guy. I really appreciated it. And uh, I just thought it was an outstanding book and uh, has uh, great illustrations in it, of course, and everything. But also what you brought in, and let's talk about for a second here. Uh, your uh, DVD here? Yes. Keeper of the Flame. Mm -hmm. And so are these available on a website or how no, would they find these? No, I just these? give them away. These are just yeah, handouts? I'm not so into marketing. Shows? I see. Because you also have a, there's a CD out there as well that's also yeah. by the same title. Uh huh. And those are original compositions. Those are on iTunes. Okay. Yeah. I've seen it on YouTube as well. It's uploaded there. And getting to the music, um, you brought in one of your guitars here. Why don't you hold that up and uh, talk about it a little bit? Let me try it here. Yeah. Okay, Spruce Hill Guitars. They made this especially for me. And uh, it's hollow body. You know, it's got a nice, you know, you can practice with it and hear mm -hmm. it. And you can feel it, it vibrates through my whole body. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel it down to my toes. So it's styled like a Strat, but a little modification on the yeah. headstock. And this custom artwork, they did that for you? Yeah, that's anodized. That's, okay. that's the metal. Wow. And on the back, it's called Keeper of the Flame. Mm -hmm. You know. So this goes with you when you're on tour, when you no. go on? 
It stays home? Yeah, well, I didn't want to insure it. Okay. You know, and plus, well, I can't say this on TV. This is the greatest guitar I ever played, people. Uh -huh. You know. Uh, you know. <laughs> it's your personal act, so yeah, you this, want to I keep this it at and home. Not lose it. Okay. And I like to play the strats. Mm -hmm. You know, I got some nice ones that they modified and stuff. Uh, now, know. how many shows a year are you doing now? Well, since I've been sober, I'm just getting back started because okay. being a, a, a bad alcoholic as I was, the promoters are uh, complaining to the management, and the management complaining mm -hmm. to the agents, and the airlines complaining to the management, you know, and why am I in this one country when I should be in Stockholm mm -hmm. and I'm in Belgium? because I'm an alcoholic. So when I, when I got clean a couple of years ago, uh, promoters had called me back and I'm doing gigs now, I'm back. Oh, I'm glad and to hear that. Everybody's happy. Yeah, I, I saw up. you many years ago mm -hmm. and I'm just glad that you're getting back to it because I hadn't heard anything for a while. So that's good yeah, to know. I had to <laughs> I had chill out. I went to Eric Clapton's uh, retreat in Antigua. Ah, yeah. Whoa, paradise, yeah. man. That was featured on 60 Minutes, too, mm -hmm. so it's good, good work that they do. Yeah. Well, well, I'm glad to hear that. And speaking of music, why don't we uh, get you back on the one plugged in? Uh, we'll take okay. it out on a little jam here. You want to play a little Red House? Sounds I'll good. Try to play, I'll try to keep up with you. No, no. It's okay. I'll hang on. Okay. Let's go. Okay, sounds like fun. Yeah. Can you hear that in there? <laughs> A little late. Where my sweet baby used to stay I said there's a red house over yonder, baby Yeah, where my sweet baby used to stay Yeah, on 23rd and Jefferson Seattle, Washington. I ain't been home see my baby in 99 in one half days. Yeah, something going on. Now wait a minute, something's wrong. You know this key don't fit that door no more. Somebody been in my back door. I said, wait a minute, something wrong. This kid don't fit that door no more. I'm not talking about the key to the lock. You know what I'm talking about, girls. I forgot the words, but my baby, she don't live here no more. 